So I would always, always be at the electronic tent at like eight years old, dancing with like, you know, some, there was drags there, right? And um, all the homosexual guys that were really good at dancing, you know, because I wasn't into country as a child. And, you know, I was never mistreated or, you know, I was always well taken. I knew that when I was at Shoreline Village, like alone with a friend of mine, I was the safest place I could be in Los Angeles. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome back to my podcast, Christian in Progress. My name is Samuel Perez, and just a little bit about myself, I am a former gay stripper. That's right, you heard that correctly. <laughs> I left behind the homosexual lifestyle to walk with Christ, and this podcast is all about how I do it, why I do it, and to educate people that are like me and people that aren't like me. I wanna talk, but I really wanna talk about what a life with Jesus looks like in 2020, and nothing is off limits, and I wanna be as transparent as I possibly can be. So before we get started, I just wanna let everyone know that this podcast is completely free to listen to, and we do accept donations, and we have some awesome rewards and gifts for those who wanna become patrons of the podcast. If you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts or Podbean, click on the description down below and you'll find the link to become a patron of the podcast, which means you'll be making a regular monthly commitment. And we also have my link tree where you can find resources to give through PayPal, Venmo, or Cash App. So on today's episode, we will be speaking to Nicole Gauss and she grew up with two lesbians as her mom. And eventually she had an encounter that despite her childhood upbringing, she came to Christ. How are you, Nicole? I am good. How are you doing? I'm doing super well. Um, I'm so excited to have you on the show and to I'm talk about this. I'm super excited as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so let's just get right into it. Like you okay. had two lesbian moms growing up. Like how did that work? Like did they adopt you? Um, did you have like a dad with the mom? Like what's going on here? What's the situation? I, well, um, I have a mom and a dad <laughs> and uh, my mother I would say came out of the closet probably I must have been around two or three because I don't have a memory of my parents together and uh, from there I actually had lived on a, a yacht with my dad and my mom and dad had lived on a yacht and my mom moved on the land and she had a partner and as a child I didn't really understand or anything but and I was too young to actually be affected by it so I don't have that divorce effectiveness going on there so but yeah so that's how that's how this story starts. That's really interesting. Okay, so your mom comes out. She's married to your dad. Um, she didn't know previous to that she had feelings for a woman or did this just like spontaneously happen? Like what was going on there? Is she bisexual? Not, I don't think she's bisexual. Like I'm 100% my mom is not bisexual, but I think she just didn't know. She didn't know, but she said that she got married because, you know, it was kind of the right thing to do back then. And she probably saw, obviously saw something in my father that she loved, right? Um, I don't know what her reasons. Um, she doesn't, she hasn't really disclosed reasons of why she left my father, but it, for some reason it wasn't because she was a lesbian it was just for other reasons maybe just differences you know just we lots of people have a lot of marital differences too right on why they divorce not necessarily for those reasons but um you know she never explained it to me as a little kid because she knew i wouldn't understand she was very respectful of that yeah okay cool mm -hmm. so you had um when you were growing up it wasn't just you and your mom there is another one of her partners like did she have a long time partner when you guys were growing up or or was she just a single mom for a while? Uh, no, she had uh, her first partner who I absolutely love to death and I, and I still talk to every now and then. Um, she just wanted that lifestyle where she has a long life partner. She wasn't into seeing tons of people or living that kind of lifestyle. <clears throat> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah and that's, um, that's really interesting because um, I feel like a lot of people go through that. Um, we live in today where I feel, well, mostly your mom, she's kind of a rare case because this was a long time ago. This was before, you know, the LGBTQ movement and mm -hmm. um, the acceptance of gay people in our society, you know, so largely through, you know, RuPaul's Drag Race, or, you know, mainstream media. But... I knew who RuPaul was when I was a little girl, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because yeah. that, I mean, that was kind of like his, oh, his yeah, era. Yeah. 
So yeah. um, for those of you who don't know who RuPaul is, it's a drag queen. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, that's, it's really interesting now today. I know there's a lot of people who can relate to your story because, well, now there's a lot more children that are growing up who have a, a lesbian mom or who have two gay dads. Um, but back then, I'm sure it was much more rare. Um, it wasn't as common. Uh, but it's really interesting, too, because not only do we just have children who are in that um, situation, but we also have uh, parents themselves who want to walk away from their traditional marriages. They want to walk away from their wife or from their uh, husbands, you know, and they want to go and be in a homosexual relationship. So um, and as we as Christians, we kind of really need to understand what how God works in that. So that's kind of why I wanted to bring you into the show. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about um, your experiences because especially nowadays, Christians, it's crazy. They want to control everything. And I don't think we're uh -huh. meant to control the world. I think we're just supposed to be the salt and the light of the world. And we're supposed to love people. But Christians yeah. really want to control um, homosexual couples from having children or from starting a family. And as I, I'm a traditional Christian, obviously, I, I love the Bible, I love scripture, I know that there's beauty in the family, and God did it one way, which was male and female, and there's a reason for that, and there's a reason for the roles in a yeah. traditional, you know, marriage and family, but um, also, secular people are going to be secular people. <laughs> people without God are going to be people without God, and there's nothing we can do to try to stop that, especially. Yeah, we're, we're, it's like, regardless if, you know, if they're gay or straight or whatever or bi, like if you don't have God. <laughs> yeah. But your story, difficult. your story is a story of hope. It's uh, someone who was raised with two lesbian moms and still came to Christ, which seems kind of like um, a, a huge surprise to most Christians. It's like, oh, we can't give these lesbians a kid or we can't give these uh, mm -hmm. two men a kid because they're going to indoctrinate them or they're going to brainwash uh -huh. them to make uh -huh. them. It's totally not the case. Yeah. Talk a little yeah. bit about that. Um, well, I, I like, to, I like to call this uh, old world gay people and new world gay people. So anyone gay from, I don't know, nineties and up, I, if I feel uh, had different parenting and my mom's generation and the lesbians I know from her generation had different parenting right? Uh, we, we saw, they saw a different society than we have now, right? So I would be very wary personally, and I'm just saying this very clear, that of anyone like nowadays growing up and wanting kids uh, with a gay lifestyle, if their motive is to push their child to become gay, like there was no lesbian that my mom knew or was around me that pushed their lifestyle on me, that said that I would end up gay or the possibility I should end up gay, uh, they all believed that I would meet a man one day and get married and have children because clearly they knew I wasn't gay, right? Now it'd be different if a gay people had a gay child, that's completely different. And as a, a gay parent, you would know your child is gay, right? Yeah. And so they knew clearly that I was straight as a two by four. <laughs> and, do, you, um, do you think um, that someone is more prone to be gay if they are in um, a family with a homosexual relationship, like two dads and, and or two lesbian moms, do you think that that child is more prone to being gay? Um, I the thing is, I was very much alone when it came to being like the only gay or child with the gay parents. Like there was nobody I knew, unless it was out of all the kids. I went to there was one kid, and we didn't talk about it because we didn't want to be made fun of, right? But I was the only one I knew. Like even amongst my mom's friends. And even her homosexual friends, like there was no children. There was no children. And a lot of them, they didn't have access to their their family members uh, because of fear, right? Like if they were, they were already ostracized by their family. So they didn't have, they loved when I came over, they always loved to babysit me. They, they, I was spoiled in that environment because there was no children. Like the gay lifestyle has no children. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't, right? And so I live that and I know what that environment's like. So the family dynamic is being crushed right now and it is so important. I don't know where kids are going to get that. They're not going to get it in the gay community. Um, and there's a small amount of uh, 
homosexuals and lesbians who are adopting kids and we actually know some as well and they have been amazing parents as best they could for foster children as well and I don't really believe in denying people if the people have a stable I mean all it comes down to your income and your house like where you live and stuff like that they don't just throw kids to just whoever right and um I know one lesbian couple have raised nine boys, nine boys. And if it wasn't for the fact that the main caregiver of the boys was a total like butchy lesbian, she, she's the mom and the dad for those kids. And, um, and a lot of them have alcohol fetal syndrome. They were kids with parents who were drug users and stuff. Right. But, you know, other than having the disabilities, they are pretty decent kids, you know, and they end up adopting the first one that they fostered, right? So th there's people who care whether they're gay, bi, or straight, right? There's people who do care about children, and I don't think they should be denied. There's plenty of single moms out there not doing a good job or single dads not doing a good job, and just because they're not gay doesn't mean that they're better off, right? Um, kids need love and they need to be validated for their feelings. They need to be lifted up. And if they're not getting that in a straight home, then it's <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think we really, as Christians, we really have gotten off base of what we're supposed to be doing and trying to control things that Jesus never asked us to control. When I read scripture, um, I really read the commands of Jesus who says, you know, don't throw your pearls at swine. First off, first and foremost, which just basically means don't throw the things that are holy to those who are going to crush it beneath their feet. And that's what it seems like Christianity is trying to do today. There's so much of that, especially with the pandemic, um, with the LGBTQ, with the abortion. It's like you're trying to throw your holy morality to mm -hmm. an unholy people who just don't care. And no. Jesus sincerely warns us that we will be trampled. Be careful not to be trampled. It's like mm -hmm. the pearls are going to get destroyed and you're going to get destroyed in the process too, because you're, mm -hmm. you're basically fighting a losing battle. The, the real battle that we need to be fighting is the battle of love and compassion and understanding. So of course I'm for the traditional family. Like you're for the traditional family. You have a family of your own now too, right? Yes, I do. I do. And you have uh, how many kids? I have two teen teenage boys. And that's beautiful. Yeah. See, like you are a, a huge example that someone can grow up in a homosexual family and not be homosexual and still yeah. follow Christ, which is the most important because it's like, it's like, okay, they grow up to be straight or whatever, but do they love mm -hmm. Jesus? That's what's important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and you are a lover of Jesus. So that's yes. a huge, like, example of just like the fear that most christians have which is just like we yeah. can't give these homosexuals a kid yeah um we want to keep the traditional family yes the traditional family is beautiful but it's only beautiful when jesus is at the center yes it's not yes. beautiful i know a lot of and i've read a lot of testimonies of a lot of the kids that are from gay or straight families coming from highly religious christian families and, yeah, <laughs> and and, abu and abuse in a lot of those families. Almost and, all of them. Yeah, almost all of them are, and that's atrocious. Um, because the parents, as parents, you need to watch your own walk in Christ. Husbands, you are the leaders of the family, and you need to be praying to your Lord to guide you, to guide yourself, your conscience, and your family. And that's not happening. When I grew up and knowing that I wanted a family one day, like. It was like I wanted, like I knew what I was lacking because of my, you know, I had gay parents. So I knew what I wanted and I just wanted to make sure I found someone that wanted the same thing. So when I met my husband of today as well, he came from very traditional background. He's, his parents are from both from Europe, different countries in Europe, but both traditional, but not strict, strict European. And he grew up traditional and that's, I was really attracted to that, like someone who wants a family and kids and would work hard because I, I know I know I wouldn't settle for a guy who didn't work hard for his family because my dad didn't give my mom child support and my mom worked her ass off you know sorry <laughs> she worked her butt off to support me and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way with a person that I was married to you know and that's you know that's really interesting speaking of you know your family do you when when you had um when you were growing up you you didn't have a specific religion that you were taught like your mom was no. your mom wasn't a christian 
She, she was brought up probably Protestant, um, family Scottish background on my mom's side. So, um, that's, but when you, when you were growing up, no, 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 they like didn't nothing, teach you at all nothing, about God. Nothing, nothing. So then how did, how was your first encounter with God? When did you first learn about God and what, what, what was that like for you? Or did you even have an interest? I remember, um, we talked a little bit about this beforehand, um, yes. just us personally, you did have a connection to the spiritual world. And you knew that yes. the spiritual was real. Tell me about that. Um, I knew it was real. Uh, well, I get it will happen when my encounter with the stuff I saw as a child would have been kind of solidified when I spoke to my husband, who's my now husband. He was my friend. And uh, he evangelized me about Christ. But he had demonic spiritual encounters. And he was the first person in my life who I ever met that had the same, not the same exact experiences, but it had actually come across demonic encounters, right? Mm -hmm. It's funny, out of all those years I've known people, I've never had like a girlfriend who mentioned she see things or anything. I just was like, oh, so he was kind of someone to explain everything of what I actually saw and made sense of it, right? So I wasn't as, as a child tormented by spirits. I I am an artist, as you know, and I draw, I drew a lot of dark stuff. So like very, very dark stuff. I didn't draw like houses and kittens and stuff. I drew actually a lot of demonic stuff. Um, a lot of it. And that wasn't because of my mom's lifestyle. Like there was no Wiccan. There was no, there was no witchcraft. There was no um, new age. It was nothing in the lesbian environment that we were aware of. My mom wouldn't have anything to do with anything like anything on that, if she had friends that did that, she would excommunicate them um, who were into any kind of seances and stuff like that. Yeah, so, because most people, I'm just to interrupt you, interrupt you for a second. Mm -hmm. Most people, they like to mix um, LGBT with witchcraft yeah. and they like to put it together. But there is a separation of people who really are just genuinely com confused mm -hmm. about their sexual identity mm -hmm. um, or know their sexual identity, know what they want. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's other people who are just like, intertwine the two where they mm -hmm. come because i dated personally when i, I don't know why yeah. this would happen to me but yeah. every time i would meet a guy he was always a wiccan <laughs> or he was yeah. always in santeria and i'd be like what is going on so now then the new gays uh, how you would say it mm -hmm. the uh, new world <laughs> the new world gays they're they're yeah. very much into witchcraft and manifestation and all these different things but i, th mm -hmm. I think that's just honestly a lot of the newer generation as well but yeah um, well, they have access to so much too, right? Like uh, the gays in the past uh, had to live a more uh, reclusive kind of mm -hmm. life and just keep to themselves. And most of the time they can, they weren't like out there and, you know, wearing tutus and things like that. And, like I've been to uh, several gay pride parades in Los Angeles. This isn't like small town. Like I'm from Los Angeles and I've been to um, Shoreline Village gay pride festivals and it was super low key you had your raid tents you had your cowboy like area like it was all divided uh per actually it was a big like dance club right um for music and stuff so whatever if you're into electronic there was all that so i would always always be at the electronic tent at like eight years old dancing with like you know some there was drags there right and um all the homosexual guys that were really good at dancing, you know, because I wasn't into country as a child. And, you know, I was never mistreated or, you know, I was always well taken. I knew that when I was at Shoreline Village, like alone with a friend of mine, I was the safest place I could be in Los Angeles. So then so, what was your first like kind of demonic encounter um, that uh -huh. you had that just like really freaked you out and you're like, you're like, oh, this is real. Like there's um, a spiritual world. It was, uh, I would be in grocery stores or just common places like that. And I remember one time I was in the checkout with my mom and there was a guy just putting like eggs and milk on the conveyor belt, whatever. And he kind of just kind of like glanced at me and then looked back at, you know, what he's putting on the counter there. And his face went from like a normal human face to like a demonic face. And I would actually just like start growling at people. And my mom be like, stop growling at people. I can't just growl at people. I'm like, but I say, mom, he's like a bad man. And she's like, well, we can't just go around like, you know, doing that kind of stuff. And so <laughs> I would see flashes of that in people. And the only thing that freaked me out is there was a movie back in the early 2000s called Devil's Advocate with Keanu Reeves. Yeah. And there was a scene from that movie 
That was exactly what I saw. And I had a nervous breakdown in the theater uh, because the, the, the Charlize Theron's character was with two friends that were hired, you know, demons, w women possessed with demons or whatever, working for the devil. And they were in a change room and their faces changed exactly like the people I saw in the real world. And that mm. freaked me out as a kid. And other than that, like my uh, other encounters were usually in my dreams. Yeah, that's really interesting because yeah. I had kind of the same thing happen to me but it didn't start to happen to me until I moved out of my parents' home. So um, I'm a huge believer that when you're under your parents' home, you're under their leadership, you're under their protection. Mm -hmm. um, they take precedence over you spiritually, kind of, because mm -hmm. you're mm -hmm. under them, right? So then when you move and you get married, you join you know, with your partner um, through with Jesus and, and marriage and, and you start your own family and then you take precedence because you're the leader yeah. of your family. Mm -hmm. um, but I left my parents and so I separated myself from them and I ended up moving to New York City, right? Yes. That's when, right. I, when I got to New York, um, I started experiencing things that I never experienced before. I would have gut feelings telling me things were right or things were wrong. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was much stronger than just like your conscience. It was just like my gut telling me this is wrong. You cannot do this. Like you can't go there. You can't talk to this person. It was mm -hmm. really, really. That's pretty bizarre. acute. That's yeah. Pretty it, acute. Yeah. And I've never been. I'm not a. I'm not super supernatural. You know, spiritual kind of guy. Like mm -hmm. even when I connect with God now, it's very just through worship. And um, sometimes I'll have you know dreams and stuff. But I'm, mm -hmm. I've never seen demons. Never. And mm -hmm. I'm an audio or visual kind of um, spiritual world person. Yeah. Um, and I don't really go looking for those things either. Trust me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when I, when I, when I got to New York, there is these people that would, that would happen to me. I oh. couldn't look at them in the eye because it was almost like I could see past their flesh and I could see another face behind them. That was okay. like an overlay. Um, and it okay. was like demonic. It was like That's evil. That's kind of like what I saw too. Yeah. It's so weird because you don't physically see it, but no. it's like, it's like you can't, it's like, it's there. It's like, it's you like can't see it, but it's there. A good indication of time is seeing things out of your peripheral. That's a big yes, common it's, thing where you're looking straight ahead, but you actually see something walk by, but right out of that weird lens, yeah. like where, how the, you know, how optometry works, right? And because I have a friend who saw an angel, but she's half blind in one eye. And mm. she saw the angel with the half blind part. Because she knows that her peripheral ends like about here, but yeah. she ended up seeing something past that. That's crazy. Yeah, I just, I had never ha that had that happen to me. And I do believe it was because um, I was out of my parents' home. And that used mm. to happen to me all the time. I, I mm -hmm. legit could not look at someone in the eye if that would happen. And it would happen that's, very often. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I would have to look away. And mm -hmm. one time when it was happening, I looked away, I looked down and the guy who I was talking to had this tattoo that was like a Satanist symbol. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, I'm not going crazy. No, there actually is things behind them. And I, I yeah. was like, so I picked up on that. But then when I came back home to live with my parents again, after mm -hmm. my huge suic suicidal thoughts and depression, everything yeah. that I went through, my testimony, um, all of that went away. It was it, mm -hmm. like, I don't get those gut feelings anymore. I don't see those things anymore. And I think mm -hmm. like when I separate myself from my parents again, mm -hmm. um, those things are going to like, the highly acute, like um, spiritual mm, is going to increase in me when I get married or when I move out, you know, whatever mm -hmm. the case is. But anyways, yeah. that's really interesting. So mm -hmm. when you spoke to your husband mm -hmm. and he introduced you to Christ, was it like, oh, I'm really hungry to hear about this? Or, you know, what was your experience? What made you want to be like, I want to be a Christian. I want to accept this. Um, I guess I'd have to say like my understanding uh right off the bat was and other people need to realize too that if you don't really know how you're supposed to really know and i didn't know for a long time i knew who jesus was and i knew what he's done for mankind but it's kind of like i almost didn't actually know and i remember i was going to north shore alliance church in north vancouver and i had some friends that introduced us to that church and i remember just you know, when the pastor says, like, if anyone needs to come up and they need to be prayed over, like, come to the front of the church, right, and kneel down or whatever, right? And I remember, like, being really afflicted and going and 
and just bawling my eyes out of the front and almost not knowing why, why I was crying so hard. And my friend who went to the church with us came down and she prayed, uh, prayed over me. And I said to her, like, after we were done, we went back and sat down and the service was over. I, I was still a mess. Cause I was like, I'm not getting it. Like, I feel like this is something I'm not getting. And from there, I end up signing up with a home group and the book that was featured in our home group was stranger on the road to your mouse. And it was about, the, it was like, since maybe cause I'm an artist, I needed that imagery, but it was like a gap, like a crevasse or like a gap and you're here and God's here. And there's no way to cross that gap. And then there was a, and then the symbol they use was like a cross. And because of Jesus' death, you were able to walk and he was the one who bridged that gap. And I was like, oh my gosh, I finally get it. Like all this time, it was literally this. I just needed to see, because I'm so visual, I needed to see an image of like what it, what it, okay, he died, but like, I didn't know what sin was or the idea of it. Like I wasn't raised Christian, right? So mm -hmm. I wasn't, you know, when my mom told me to not, you know, have sex before marriage, to not do drugs, to not, to be, to be, have a person with integrity, to be kind, to be loving. She didn't say any of these things because she had a God idea to scare me into doing it. She just said, be a decent human being, right? When you, when you do the God scare tactic, if the kids don't know God, and, and you, as a parent, you're being kind of a douche and you're a Christian parent being a douche. And that's your only, that's their only model. Right. But my mom were gonna be through, you know, custody battles, fights with my, my, my father, you know, living, you know, on the verge of impoverishment, she kept her dignity and her stoicism, I guess, throughout all of that. So she was my example. Right. And so yeah. I just feel that, uh, what I finally understood, I mean, getting to know Jesus is a long process than just like, you know, opening up a book and home group at the same time, like you have to enrich your relationship with him. And so, but that was, that's when I was like, okay, I, I know I still don't get it, but now I get exactly what he did. We can't get to God. It doesn't matter who we are. He is a narrow gate um, that we must pass through. And that's yeah. how I figured it out. And so how did you feel now that you had learned about the gospel and you started reading scripture and you started seeing all these things about homosexuality, what were you first thinking? Was it difficult for you to think, oh, God says this is morally wrong. Mm -hmm. um, how do I feel about my mom now? Am I gonna yeah. speak to my mom about this? Yeah. Am I not? Yeah. Like, cause you didn't know what sin was beforehand. So no. now it's like, oh, how am I gonna, have reconciliation with this yeah that was i struggled with that for a long time um because i didn't think it was fair and it wasn't until i saw like i struggled with for many years right because you gotta think i just found you on youtube not too long ago and the whole idea with gay people seems so unfair like maybe for alcoholics and drug users or people, whatever other sin there's, it's like easier when it's like, who, like who says it's easier to get off drugs? It's not easy to get off drugs or alcohol either, right? And that's just me being naive and not knowing any better. But I just struggled with it because, you know, I obviously I want my mom and people I care about to go to heaven, right? So I just didn't feel it was fair because I feel that gay people didn't have a choice. And if they were born that way, it was like, then that's the way you are. It was like, um, you know, being born with an arm missing or something like that. Uh, and that's back then. Like I thought people were just born that way. Right. And, uh, and I didn't, and not knowing about sin, like what would I even know at this point? So I struggled with that with a long time. And especially from the words of my dad, you know, he took me to church or tried to take me to church. And it was <laughs> like, I was racially awesome. I was spit on in Sunday school. So for just being mixed race. So it was like church for me, for my dad trying to introduce me around eight or nine years old was not a good experience. And, um, and my, no one was going to mess with my dad. He's like a six foot four black guy. He was in the Navy. Like no one's going to say anything to him either. So he would say to me, you know, take me back to my mom's, like, you know, your mother's a lesbian and you know, she's, she's going to hell then. And I just felt that something was off about that. Like, it just seems so like, okay, so then it's just that easy then. It's just like, well, 
you're gay, you're just going to hell and you're not, so you're fine. And then not knowing any concept of sin, you know, my dad is still a sinner, still saying this, right? Everyone who says that stuff is still a sinner, you know? Yeah. And Let's talk was, about that. Let's talk yeah. about that because we feel, I don't know, I'm constantly, um, same with you. It was really difficult for me saying that mm -hmm. I was living it, but you, yeah. you had someone who was going through it in your life. But me living through it, I just kept asking myself, I'm like, it does seem very unfair. Because I didn't yeah. choose this. I didn't choose mm -hmm. to have same-sex attraction. Um, who knows whether it came psychologically or whether mm -hmm. um, I was born with something in my DNA or something. Yeah. I don't know. Whatever happened, I didn't choose it. I'm just yeah. here and I'm dealing with it. So I, for many years, I too was like, God, this isn't fair. But then I realized um, it, if it's homosexuality, or if it's um, problems with drugs, or if it's problem with being a thief, or if it's problem with lying, you know, or whatever it is your case, we all have to realize that Jesus has to become the root of everything in our lives. And yes, there's going to be some areas that are going to be easier for some people, but mm -hmm. also just comparison is wrong too. Mm -hmm. You know, just to say, oh, a straight person has it easier with God because they can go and get married to someone. Yeah. Marriage means nothing. <laughs> if anything, yeah. marriage brings more problems. But it we does. live in a society where we think to ourselves, oh, um, uh, I, there's this old Lana Del Rey song, which was just like, um, it's uh, <laughs> the world was made for two. That's what she says in one of the lyrics. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> and yeah. it's, it's kind of like that. It's like everywhere you go, the world is kind of like, it functions for two people. Like if you go to a restaurant, if you go by yourself, it's just awkward. If you go to the movies, if you go by yourself, it's just mm -hmm. awkward, you know? So yeah. we are third, custom. Third wheels to, are awkward too, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, we're, <laughs> we're custom to just always be doing something with someone else. And society tells us that's our biggest goal, but it's really not our biggest goal. So when we compare no. ourselves to, oh, I'm gay and this straight person has it easier to follow Christ, because they're straight and they can now live a life where everywhere they go, they have someone to be with. Mm -hmm. um, that's a wrong comparison because yeah, they're going to- I thought that too, right? Like, I'm like, that seems completely unfair. Yeah, it, but it's a wrong comparison because it's you wrong, know what? Yeah. They ha have their issues that you'll never get to go through. So for example, for mm -hmm. me, um, I love being single in this season of my life. Do I believe that one day I'll get married? 100% mm -hmm. yes, it's been prophesied. And mm -hmm. I do believe I'll meet a perfect woman who is going to love me for who I am. And mm -hmm. it's going to be beautiful. And we're going to start a family. That's one mm -hmm. of my goals. But if that never happens, I don't mm -hmm. care. Because mm -hmm. I'm like, my main goal is Jesus. Like yeah. he is my lover. He's my everything. And that's the way we need to fix our mind is not comparing ourselves to things or other people who have things that might seem easier. Yeah. But in reality, it's not easy. Everyone is fighting their own battles. It's you know, a grass is greener mentality as well. You know, whether you're straight or gay or, or whatever sexual identity, you, it's, it's, you'll never find perfection in another person. Yeah. And people are looking for other people to validate their life or make them happy. Yeah. And that's not the case. You have to strengthen your walk with God. And, um, you know, many people who are even straight and not just gay people are not walking with the Lord and then they're having a hard time. And it, it makes me really sad, you know, because, you know, I've been there, you know, I've, I can't say that I haven't struggled. You're obviously, you've, you've been there as well. The thing is, you know, God's leveled the playing field when everyone who's born into this world is born into sin. That's where this whole, you know, like pointing finger narrative that just doesn't die right but that's the enemy also playing with you like when you mm -hmm. do that you're getting played by the enemy in the end if you use your jesus titleship or knowing god titleship to um accuse others to belittle others because somehow you think you're great you're being you're getting played in the end right because that's yeah. exactly what he wants he wants the most people to be he wants people to be abused by christians or mistreated by christians or whatever right because then it's just going to make everything to do with god and christ look bad god always has a victory in the end we know that right but yes. it's uh but i think it's time now like christians need to smarten up and focus on their own walk yes like and i think 100 percent it's easier to just look at somebody else and to point out flaws and what they can and cannot do. And that's what we see with Christianity. That's mm -hmm. why I have you on the show because most Christians are like unacceptable 
two yeah. lesbian moms, two yeah. homosexual dads. We yeah. have to keep the sanctity of marriage. No, no, no. Yeah. You don't have to do anything. No. God is in control. If God was so like adamant about keeping a family, he wouldn't have given us free will. He would have just made us robots. He's or not like scared. Or whatever. Yeah. Exactly. He's yeah. not scared of sin. He has a plan in the end and Jesus is going to mm. be king and he's going to rule. And then from then on, it is going to be perfect and glorious and wonderful. Mm -hmm. Right. But for this moment, he's given us all free will and we should also yeah. extend grace to other people who are in that position or don't look like the traditional family or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Because once again, we're trying to enforce a morality to people who just don't have those type of convictions and they just won't. And you yelling at them is not going to make a difference. How no. about we self-reflect, we look at ourselves and we ask ourselves, how can I be more humble? Because God gives grace to the humble. How can I look at my flaws and work on me? And in the same time, when I look at my flaws, I can relate to other people who also have flaws uh -huh. and learn how to love them better instead uh -huh. of, um, because you won't, you won't want to judge someone when you realize, oh, I'm, I'm not a prize either. I'm no mm -hmm. one's reward here. You know, yeah. um, you're not going to, but if you think you're a prize, if you think you're better than you really are, um, mm -hmm. you're going to look at everyone else with judgmental eyes. And that's yeah. what as Christians, we really need to do. So one more question. Mm -hmm. How do you now, um, your mom, she's still a lesbian, correct? Yes, she is. How do you now deal with still having a lesbian mom and being a Christian, do you guys get along? Oh, my mom and I have an amazing relationship. Uh, I was a pretty non, I wasn't a very rebellious kid because my mom allowed me to have freedom. She didn't constrict me with things. Uh, and when she told me not to do things, it was always out of logic and not like, because I had a Christian friend who, was told the things that I was never told, like, why would they tell you that, right? Even though I didn't know who God was, right? But I'm like, why would they tell you to, you know, not sleep around with boys because you don't want to get pregnant? Or, you know, why would you want a baby right now <laughs> or something, right? Like, it's just your body. I mean, if anything, you know, the lesbian community back then was all about like, you're, you're a young girl, you respect your body. You know what I mean? Like you don't need men to validate you. Like, I don't know what it's like nowadays. It seems like it's, it's, it's now even more free love with the younger generation of just trying all this stuff. And it's like, they weren't like that when I was a kid, they were very much like, you can find your partner and, you know, and do what you want. But like, you know, I had, I've had like, like lesbians like get on the phone and talk to my like boyfriends and it was so embarrassing right like you make sure you treat her right and like stuff like that and you know as a kid they taught me about self self-respect of my body you know and myself and to just don't do things and so um because of the certain of the consequences right but i didn't go chasing my feelings the thing is my household my feelings are validated um my hopes and dreams were appreciated. Um, I was loved. Even though my mom was busy with work, I was still loved. She didn't come home and backhand me and do all this stuff or tell me I'm like, you know, worthless, whatever. So the fact that I didn't have these things, I was able to mentally grow as a well-rounded child um, and into an adult. Not like perfect, but just kind of not have issues where I struggled. I never struggled with self-esteem or feeling like I wasn't good enough or I didn't struggle with, um, you know, I didn't need drugs. I didn't do drugs as a kid because I just didn't like what for, right? And, you know, a lot of times we do drugs and do those things because we're dealing with all those ugly things that our parents made us feel that way or bullies and stuff like that. So yeah. since I didn't have all that stuff, I was a very, very happy kid and, and freedom, physical freedom where I surfed most of my younger life and being home alone lots like if anything i lacked was you know good dinners on the table and and someone home a lot of the time i was a lock and key kid like from the 80s right mm -hmm. so but back in the 80s it was a lot safer than it is now you know and we i was just free to go surf ride my bmx like do all that kind of stuff and made sure i was home at a certain time take my dogs rollerblading and life wasn't like insanely difficult like teenagers nowadays they make their lives and especially i swear like the trans game they make their lives more difficult with all the stuff they siphon into their heads from yeah. the internet opposed to just like just living 
you know they can't yeah. nobody can just live anymore right so yeah. not just christ you know interceding on their behalf and knowing who he is they have it's like their cup is getting overflowed mm -hmm. and you know everyone's getting hard to reach yeah so then how would you say now um let's say somebody is in their lives right now um has a family member or someone who is dealing with homosexual attractions i've talked about this what do you think your opinion is how should you treat that person do you tell them about god do you not tell them about god do you tell them that they're going to hell do you not um what do you do like what do you personally do for your mom well god knows my heart and i love her to death and so i just leave my mother in god's hands like there's nothing i can do to convince her anything she has to have that you know as I, like, I like to call it the hammer of Thor revelation where your just eyes are opened. Your yeah. eyes have to be open. Their eyes have to be open. And you know that even, and if, and that, like, like I said earlier that God levels a playing field, we have to understand that when we see someone doing wrong, we have to understand to come to Jesus. We have to know we were already wrong and worthless and sinners already. So you just have compassion on that person and pray for them. Pray that God will intercede at some point in their life. Cause you know what? Say I had like a younger sister who is a lesbian and struggling or lesbian and living fine. Right. Um, it doesn't matter. They could be a, she could be straight and living awful and straight living fine, fornicating, whatever, right? She can be in her marriage and she can be, you know, there's adultery or whatever. It doesn't matter. Everyone's going to, everyone's going to have something, right? I just know that what happens is that we are all mortals and at any point in time I can die and my opinion is dust. It's dust. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, in the end, I died in a car accident and who knows from my, if I prayed about that person, that at that point, at some point in their life, 20 years later, they came to Christ. Like, yeah. I'm not going to know, you know what I mean? And I may not know, and then that's okay. So we have to know that everything is, uh, what is it? Everything is kind of up in the air. Like it's only God's time. Yeah. God's went god's will everything and we can't will our will into people's lives yeah everything has to be holy spirit led mm -hmm. and the holy spirit is patient is mm -hmm. gentle is kind i'm telling i love the fruits mm -hmm. of the spirit because yes, whenever yes. you bring up the fruits of the spirit to religious people it's like <laughs> you know they, they got nowhere to yeah. go because no, they, they, they gotta say something <laughs> yeah you gotta say something. you gotta control you gotta manipulate the situation to have your way or you got to scare them into mm -hmm. believing in jesus it's another thing it's just like mm -hmm. you scare people into the idea of like oh if you don't accept jesus you're gonna go to hell but actually we should be telling people do you know that there is a beautiful love that is waiting for you in Jesus? Mm -hmm. Like don't scare people into just accepting Jesus so they can avoid hell. They mm -hmm. probably would never encounter Jesus anyways, and then still end up going to hell, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. saying it with their, with their mouth. But yeah. if you tell people about how much love Jesus has to offer and they, not only you just telling them, you just showing it like mm -hmm. people, they, they, they care more about, for example, how you treat them than what you say, you know? So yeah, if you're exactly. showing the beautiful love of Christ, they're going to be like, Oh, I actually believe you because you don't just talk about the beautiful love of Christ. Like you've shown me what the beautiful love of Christ looks mm -hmm. like. Yeah. So it's really beautiful. I mean, I love, I, I, I've loved having you on the show and just showing that you're an amazing example of what it looks like that, you know, there might be a child that has two lesbian moms or to homosexual dads and they grow up just fine obviously having normal issues like everybody has issues uh -huh. um and they end up receiving christ too you know nothing is too far gone for for jesus nothing is too far gone for god yeah. so um how would you say like a last words or last thoughts um what what is something that you feel like christians need to know about your situation and what what you've been through um, to know that, that even myself who grew up in this lifestyle and not having any real, like truthful access to who Christ was, you know, I don't know who prayed for me. I don't know if God just like, well, I'm going to, I'm going to see what that one thinks about me, you know? Um, 
it's it's been a long journey that's for sure and it has its ups and downs and i feel that people need to just have patience uh with other people people need to have patience with themselves i think a lot of it's looking inward to making sure because you know our our hearts you know before we come to christ our hearts are kind of black or icy or how much ice, you know, God's going to pick off of that heart, right? And he has to move in there and you have to allow him. It's not like knowing, oh, I believe in Jesus. He died for my sins. So now I'm going to now look to my neighbors and all that they're doing wrong because I already know I'm going to heaven. It's like you have another thing coming if that's what you believe. You need to make sure that your walk with God is sound. Mm -hmm. It's a daily thing. And, you know, I got to the point where, you know, it was very hard. I've been there. I've been hard there when it's hard to read the Bible, right? And you have to be, I mean, for me, it was being becoming rock bottom, you know, to start reading the word. And the more the enemy tells you lies about who God is, mm-hmm. big time. And I got a book from someone. It's called God, I Want to Know You. And that was a huge eye opener, this book, because a lot of people, you know, you see all this bad stuff in the world and you're like, why well how do i deal with this you know and prayer is your weapon like you're not supposed to fight god is the one who does the fighting and if people have strongholds in their life with sin there's something behind that holding on to them in in regards i'm not talking about like like possession or stuff like that i'm talking about that everyone comes with a stronghold that they get they acquire they go out and chase or whatever and it becomes a stronghold right like i'm not saying like babies have strongholds and stuff like that like we develop this stuff and we allow things into our life or we do things that allow sin into our life the people Mm -hmm. who don't mess with witchcraft don't sleep around or whatever and you get people who are you know, virgins or who don't, but they're still, they, they, they still, they're still sinners. You know what I mean? And sometimes those people wish something bad would happen so they can have that. And a lot of the people who've had bad stuff happen, they're like, you don't want to wish that. If you can refrain from being affected emotionally and physically from the harm that other people have, that's beautiful. And that's okay. Right. So the main thing is always just prayer. Is prayer like, is prayer. Prayer is going to be the yeah. one that's going to make the way for, yeah. for example, yeah. your mom. And then also just releasing mm-hmm. things up to God. Yeah. Like, like letting, letting go. And even, even if you have like, say you haven't looked at your own walk and you're struggling with like a aunt or, or sister who has, it's like, it's not about what you think about them. God knows what he thinks about them. And that's important. You need to just ask your own self, like, what am I struggling with? Where can I find grace? Speak to God before you speak to other people. That is so important. Yeah, I can because... say if I can leave anything with this conversation is if you feel Because sometimes if you're wanting so badly to talk to somebody about whatever they're doing wrong, a lot of the time that is just your flesh. Mm -hmm. Or self-reflection too. Yeah, self-reflection. You you see something that you don't like about that person because you have it inside of you too. I've I've found that the most homophobic Mm -hmm. people are the people who are really against LGBTQ, Mm -hmm. um, which we should all always have a morality against what we believe to be right. These people who yeah. are like really attacking violent, like angry, yeah. they're not yeah. fruits of the spirit. Um, no. Mostly it's because they themselves have things inside of them that are leaning towards, yeah. you know, gay attitudes. Yeah. Or it's called projecting, sexual behavior. isn't it? Isn't projecting? It? projecting? Yeah, okay. sorry. Self-reflection. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, no, they haven't self-rejected, self-reflected because uh, they're projecting at that point. But yeah. even just having lots of self-righteousness and yeah. thinking that you need to say something to somebody when all you need to do is just pray about it. if so it's pray about almost it. like yeah if someone's going through something and you feel it's wrong if anything you should have love and fear for that person and concern not yeah. judgment you need to say you know god so they're doing something that's going to be detrimental and harmful to their life yeah. whether it's drugs or you know you know and you knowing you knowing that no matter what you say is not going to change that behavior it's no, just exactly. it's you being holy spirit led to prayer and then letting yeah. the holy spirit make the way make the path make the opportunities for you to yeah. enter in once you've loved that person so yeah. um that's you know it's it's really beautiful i'm so glad to have you on and i'm so glad to have these types of conversations because there's so many people out there who are just so against everything and we really have to open up our minds a little bit to say oh wait mm-hmm. god is in control 
God knows what he's doing in this child's life. God knows what he's doing with those two lesbians people. You know, you never know what you're not God. That's, that's the whole thing. The only thing that as Christians we've been called to do is to instruct people. Number one, to tell people about the gospel, the good news yeah. and to, to love people and to love God. And then also to make learners, to make disciples. And if you don't know how to love yourself, you haven't taken care of your issues, then you mm. won't be able to make learners. You won't be able to make disciples because you won't be able to love them. And no, you can't love yourself if you haven't accepted the love of Christ mm. because that's all he does. He just literally wants us to know that he loves us. That's well, the gospel. Exactly. And being guided by the Holy Spirit when God does, the Holy Spirit does prompt you to say something. Of course. If the Holy Spirit speaks for you, it's going to be way more impactful than your own flesh speaking to them. Like exactly. if you speak out of your flesh, you're going to mess up. <laughs> like exactly. I guarantee, you know? Yeah. And most yeah. people, trust me, when you, when I, I, I really have seen that the issues are really the least things that we need to focus on. It's mm-hmm. really how we can accept the love of Jesus and how we can walk in that love and how we can get closer to Jesus that the issues start to fade away. And I think, I think that's mm-hmm. what religion focuses too much on these issues to the point where I have to go on YouTube and make a whole video about a, a woman who has two lesbian um, moms yeah. Because we're so issue oriented instead yeah, of, yeah. and this video is going to do a lot better than if I went on the internet and just talked about God's love. Because some yeah. people are so consumed with just issues, but yeah. that's why we do what we do to yeah. point people to hate. It's not about the issues. It's not about the homosexuality. It's not about mm-hmm. the sin. It's about mm-hmm. the good news. It's about the love of Jesus. Let's fall more yeah. in love with him. So yeah. thank you so much, Nicole, for coming You're on welcome. the show. You're welcome. I love having you. I love having you as a friend. Um, you do some Twitch streaming where you're currently an artist right now. So, she, yes. so you're yeah. married, you have kids, wonderful, yeah. beautiful family, yeah. Christian family, and yes. you also stream on Twitch. Tell me yes. just a little bit about that before we go. Uh, yeah, I'm a character designer. Uh, I was a character designer for television for many years back in the early 2000s. And I have been drawing my whole life and my husband as well, most of his life. And we're both in that industry. Um, and yeah, I just draw live for people and it's a lot of fun. And it literally brought me back to like, you know, being, being a mom, I love being a mom, but I found that and, and I used to go to comic cons and stuff like that and do, and do like, just meet people. I love meeting people. I love meeting other artists. And so I find that Twitch is an amazing platform to meet other artists yeah. and just meet people, help people reach out to people. I love talking to people, see how their day was. Like, I just, I have such passion for people. Like I just, I, yeah. I'm a, a type I always sees the good in people, you know, and, and wants, and wants the best for others, you know? So where can people find your Twitch? Uh, BMX Shark Art. BMX Shark Art. All yes. right, awesome. And I'll yeah. soon be joining you on yes. Twitch too, and we could probably yeah. hopefully collaborate. I just yeah. started a Twitch channel. I haven't put anything on there. I'm just testing things out. <laughs> I know. It's always <laughs> slow, the slow startup, right? Yeah, but I'm so excited to jump on there and kind of do my own little thing too. My username currently on there is Burritos and Jesus. <laughs> I love it. I absolutely love it. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about food and Jesus <laughs> at the same time, making good Christian entertainment. All right, nice. guys. Thank you so much yes. once again for joining us on the Christian in Progress podcast. I really hope mm. that you've walked away with some something um, on this interview about how to evangelize to people um, who are dealing with same-sex attraction or who are homosexual and gay. Um, And I hope it's opened your mind a little bit more about how God is willing to work even in the unconventional family traditions that we might have, um, that he's able to rescue and able to pour himself out on Nicole, who had no opportunity from both her parents. Um, to hear from God. I mean, kind of her dad, but (laughs) anyways. So thank you guys once again for joining us on this episode and we'll see you next time. Bye.